Uh, uh, I'm going a little deep, uh, delivering a uh, kind of not postscriptum but postdictum uh, of my uh, and Uri Gershovich uh, a, year, a year ago published book, which is called uh, uh, Conceived and uh, Opened in the Talmud. Uh, and the book deals with the hidden composition and the hidden meaning uh, of the treatises of the Talmud, tractates of the Talmud. And this book involved myself uh, into the, uh, you know, kind of uh, unhappy thinking about the very possibility of systematically delivering uh, the history of Jewish thought and a systematic delivering of the history of thought generally. When me was uh, nearly the same age as Misha now and even earlier, I was studying the history of Russian thought, uh, which nearly did not include any philosophy. Russian philosophy started in the beginning of the 20th century, maybe <coughs> some years earlier, but there was no history of Russian philosophy between the beginning of the 20th century. And there was uh, a necessity for uh, the authors of textbooks and general introductions to write the history of Russian philosophy, or the history of so-called wealth and charm uh, of uh, Russian great thinkers. And Russian great thinkers, uh, uh, quote unquote, they were either poets uh, or uh, writers uh, or musicians or something like this. Uh, so they started to, uh, they tried to uh, chop the thoughts uh, and the uh, writings of Russian poets and writers and to put it uh, into the scheme, uh, into the graphs uh, of uh, general philosophy like ethics, aesthetics, uh, anthology, mythology, something like this, uh, epistemology, and that was an artificial uh, genre, artificial history of Russian thought. Now, <clears throat> nearly the same idea uh, and the same obstacle uh, existed when uh, first uh, authors of uh, the textbooks on Marxism, Leninism, uh, were making these textbooks uh, in the 20s. Uh, generally, neither Marx nor Engels wrote anything philosophically, philosophically founded. They were no, not, they were philosophically educated, they were philosophically thinking. But they were not writing philosophical treatises. But there was a need to have Marx and Leninism as a philosophy. So these guys, they were chopping the uh, writings of Marx and Engels into the same scheme, uh, the same graphs, like epistemology, anthology, uh, ethics, aesthetics, and so on and so on. Uh, generally, what, what I'm speaking about is the general trend uh, in writing uh, the, not only the history of thought, but uh, the uh, essence of the sort of itself uh, in uh, various introductions. Let us remember that uh, Summa uh, Theologiae, uh, or Theologiae, the, the English pronunciation, which was written in the, uh, by Thomas uh, uh, Aquinas yes, in the 13th century, actually was um, designed to be a textbook uh, for young people uh, interested in uh, uh, Christian theology. And uh, it was designed uh, according to the major problems uh, to be solved 
and these were the problems of God uh, as uh, the center of uh, Christian thinking, then the, the problem of human being uh, as uh, uh, somebody who was made in the image of God, and the problem of the world, and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, the material which uh, Thomas had to use uh, was not philosophy. In the basis of his deliberations, there was the Bible. And the Bible is not philosophy. Though, at least, he was helped by a long tradition of Christian theology, which already uh, made uh, huge efforts uh, to, uh, to, to convert uh, non-philosophical Jewish biblical thinking into philosophy, into rational, systematical, theological thinking. And that was uh, his advantage. Now, what to say about Jewish philosophers? Uh, let us start with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Saadia Gaon, uh, who was writing uh, in the uh, 9th, 10th centuries. Uh, and uh, again, with the idea to enlighten uh, a young generation uh, um, in Jewish thought, in, in major problems of Jewish thought, in order that this generation could withstand the seduction <coughs> of Karaites. So, again, the major basis of his book uh, was supposed to be the Talmud and the Bible, Torah. But Torah uh, is not philosophy, as you everybody know. And as for the Talmud, uh, the Talmud explicitly rejects Greek philosophy as Kokhmai Vamit. And uh, uh, the Tractates and the treatises of the Talmud are anything by philosophy. They are not systematically designed, they are not structured, they have no image of uh, philosophical books. Nevertheless, uh, he managed to write his uh, book, which was called uh, Amunot Vadiot. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, this, this heading, this title, uh, doesn't belong to the author himself. This is the translation made by uh, Ibn Tibon in the 13th century. The book was written in Arabic uh, since uh, the sword of his philosophical knowledge uh, was Arabic uh, theology, Kalam. Uh, so he uh, rationalized, he not only rationalized Talmudic thinking, uh, he chopped it into the forms uh, of philosophical uh, dilemmas, philosophical uh, designs. And so you have this uh, somatology in Jewish image. In the middle of the 12th century, a prominent Jewish scholar, uh, whose uh, name was Ephraim Ola, everybody knows, President of uh, uh, Israeli Academy, very prominent school. He wrote a book which was called Hazal, uh, the chapters of beliefs and uh, knowledge. The same. He added the, the word Perke, the chapters. Uh, as a matter of fact, he did the same job as used to do uh, his predecessor, Saadia Gaon. Moreover, his, his uh, uh, work, his job was uh, made easier because he had this famous predecessor. He could use the grass 
and the schemes of this predecessor uh, in order to uh, fill in like gefilte fish uh, this uh, philosophical design with various sayings uh, of uh, Talmudic thoughts. Uh, generally, this is the old European uh, tradition of Weltanschau. Uh, when you study uh, things like this uh, at Hebrew University, for example, you would never call it Jewish philosophy, you would call it, uh, there was no Jewish philosophy in the Talmud, you would call it the history of Jewish which is, some, what, what does it mean, thought? Something very um, uncertain. Uh, so is it, is it really possible to uh, cook uh, the fish uh, as it is and not to chop it into gefilte fish? This is the major uh, methodological problem which stands uh, before uh, a researcher when he approaches uh, these things. Uh, so, uh, when me and Uri Gershovich started uh, this book, we were standing, uh, we were not standing before this uh, uh, problem because uh, A, uh, our, uh, we're not writing the book. We started it as uh, uh, we started translating general Sugiyot uh, from uh, the Bali uh, for Steinzelt's edition of his own in Yaakov, uh, and Yaakov, his own anthology of Jewish Agada from the Talmud. B, uh, during this uh, translation, uh, we came to certain conclusions. And we, when we started uh, convert our conclusions into papers, uh, the first thing we were doing was just structural analysis of the treatises and not the explication of the thought, uh, exp not the exposition of the thought uh, of these treatises for our readers. But as long as we were doing it, uh, we uh, understood that both of us uh, kind of hated uh, the great book of Umbach. Uh, for us, this was a kind of um, you know, uh, uh, rape. Uh, he, he raped Jewish thought, uh, making from it a gefilte fish. Uh, and we tried, it, tried to avoid uh, this mistake. Uh, so, uh, uh, as I said, we started with structural analysis. And with structural analysis, we uh, uh, found that there was a, a kind of composition uh, in uh, the treatises of the Talmud. Uh, it was generally believed that the Talmud, the treatises of the Talmud, have no composition. Uh, the very uh, name uh, Masechet or Masechta uh, means uh, a kind of translated into English, uh, the Arag, uh, which uh, uh, have no composition, uh, just something uh, very uh, casual. Uh, and uh, the major point was that uh, uh, the sages, they were mm, uh, collecting uh, general, uh, they were collecting various thoughts and discussions and agadot and everything uh, to illustrate uh, various alakot. Uh, that means to, to make uh, uh, Jewish law uh, morally attractive and morally clear. Uh, so whatever they found they were put in king and that is the way how they filled in this fish. Uh, and this is general, uh, general idea. However, there are several, uh, uh, several exceptions, like Avram Wolfish, uh, who is proving for uh, some decades that there is a circular composition uh, in Talmudic and Mishnahic treatises. Like the circular compositions, composition which 
connects the beginning of the treaty with the end of the treaty. Why this composition exists, according to um, this guy, uh, Wolfish, this is because there was redaction, addition. The addition is because of addition. That proves that the treatises were not uh, literally uh, important uh, and uh, uh, uncouth uh, things, but they were perfect com uh, editions of uh, exquisite uh, edits, which is probably correct. Um, besides, he's proving again that the moral uh, and uh, other gadot uh, included into the treatises, they included in order to uh, make uh, halakhic material uh, attractive and clear. So this is a kind of elimination of the treatises. All these agadot, all these literal inclusions, insertions, this is literally, this is embellishment. The treatise is nothing more. And uh, the composition of it by itself is also an embellishment. Uh, so, uh, in our mind, this is not correct. This is not correct. What we try to prove in our book uh, is the idea that the, uh, the unity of the treatises uh, really exists, and there is really a kind of a circular composition due to the uh, major organic, uh, quasi-philosophical idea uh, hidden into the, uh, in the treatise. This idea underlies the surface of the treatises, uh, and in each case you have to go first to the ending of the treaty and then back to the beginning to find this idea in the composition. The idea is not unlike Christian authors, of, uh, unlike fathers of the church, were making uh, the Bible an allegory of something else. They were making allegory of allegory. They explain metaphor by metaphor. But that doesn't mean that there is no metaphor, that there is no allegory. They are allegorically built. So, uh, for example, you were researching a treatise called Shabbat, which uh, certainly uh, was devoted to the laws of Shabbat. Uh, the, uh, the, all the treatise was built on the metaphor uh, of a Shabbat lamp. And Shabbat lamp, uh, which uh, uh, in Mishle, Shabbat lamp uh, is uh, compared uh, to the uh, lamp of God. Excuse me, to the to the uh, soul of uh, human being. Ne Rashem the 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 soul of a human being is a lamp of God. <coughs> This is the basic metaphor of the treatise. And then started with, starting with this basic metaphor, the treatise developed the huge allegory about the, uh, the, the, the nefesh, the soul, which dies on the eve of Shabbat. And this is not just the soul of an uh, ordinary human being, but the soul of Mashiach. And then the ending of the treatise, isn't it here, is uh, uh, the, the resurrection. So this is the general scheme of the treaty. Uh, the same with another treaty, Gitti. Uh, again, the treaty is devoted to the uh, divorce, the lack of divorce between uh, uh, human beings. A letter sent by a husband to his wife. But the essence of the treatise is the divorce between God and Israel. And the destruction of the temple is the sign of the divorce. Hence, there is a huge sugiyah devoted to the destruction of the temple to Barakov. 
uprising and things like this, which uh, on the surface have nothing to do with the uh, halakhically designed matter of the treaties. What, what, what is it? Why we should uh, tell you about uh, uh, the siege and the destruction of Jerusalem in the context of the treaties which treats um, uh, the, the divorce? But uh, uh, there is essential connection between this. This is not embellishment. This is very, this is very essential. This is the topic of the treaties. Uh, so. Speaking this, telling this, we could also say uh, that uh, these treaties are not just, uh, uh, first of all, they, they do not have linear composition, unlike uh, the uh, tractates of the Fathers of the Church. They do not concentrate exclusively on the main topic, which I would uh, explain to you uh, in my in my stories. Uh, they have certainly some, uh, some side uh, paths, uh, some uh, casual things. So, uh, what is the cause of this uh, non-linear composition uh, of uh, uh, this way going through metaphors, not to explication of the metaphors, but to another metaphor? And then again, we should go back to the story uh, of composition uh, in uh, philosophic and quasi-philosophical literature. Uh, if we read the seventh letter of Plato, and I, I should tell you that there is no uh, uh, no unanimity about the uh, uh, about the authorship of this letter if it really belongs to Plato. So Plato uh, uh, is telling about um, Dionysius the Younger, the tyrant of uh, Syracuse, uh, whom he tried to teach and to uh, disciple, and uh, in, the, in the end uh, the, the, the disciple sold him into slavery. Uh, so after doing these terrible things, he wrote a book, a textbook, uh, with uh, an exposition of Platonic philosophy. Now, uh, Plato himself uh, is writing that he would never do things like this. He would never write a treatise, a tractate, to teach young people. He would never do a thing which uh, Thomas uh, Aquinas in the end did. Why? Because uh, uh, it is just uh, abomination. You cannot uh, make people understand whatever they do not understand by themselves. This is actually the same which is pointed out uh, in the uh, treatise Sanet. You can teach a person uh, Masa Merkava only if he understands it by himself. And this is, by the way, my experience as a teacher at Moscow State University. You cannot teach a student anything unless he has already understood it himself. This is like how it works. Otherwise, uh, he would just remember it uh, to pass the exam and forget it. So, what does it mean to understand it by himself. He would have an experience of thinking about it beforehand and an experience of discussing it with his teacher and with his co-disciples. So it must be uh, an orally designed teaching. Discussion, dialogue, never writing. And this is the idea of a person who managed to write multiple uh, beautiful uh, books, the dialogues, but the dialogues 
are not the treatises. They are the dialogues. They are quasi-discussion, quasi-orally thing. And if we go to the Talmud, we are going to the same design actually. This is quasi-orally, this is uh, Torah Bel Pen. It's not, uh, these are treatises, but these are not treatises. The same, by the way, with uh, 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 one of the fathers of the church, uh, who, by the way, was writing that one of his desire, one of his teachers was a Jew from Palestine, and this guy is Clemens from Alexandria, and uh, his major, uh, his major book is called Stromata, and Stromata again is, uh, is Rex. This is the same as Masechet. Stroma and Masechet, uh, actually Stroma is a genre of Greek literature, but the only perfect uh, example of this genre uh, is the Stromata of Clemens of uh, Alexandria. And the uh, things that uh, uh, Clemens is writing again is um, about the possibility to uh, teach what is not uh, understood previously. And besides, uh, both he and his predecessor Plato, they are telling about the uh, necessity of secrecy. It should not be exposed to everyone. Because everybody, not because everybody would take it and to, to make uh, to make it public, but because everybody would not understand and they could do something terrible. So uh, let us do it uh, in our circle, let us do for our disciples. And the same idea we can see in Talmudic treatises of Kogi. Uh, also, you cannot teach halacha besuk. Um, uh, it has been prohibited. It should be between ourselves. And uh, hence, uh, you would understand, you would explain metaphors by metaphors, uh, allegory by allegory, and not by the exposition of allegory. And that's how you uh, teach. Uh, but then, uh, how perfect are you going to teach? Again, by my own experience, uh, the results are terrible. Uh, it, is, it is a very uh, tough thing. You, uh, you would teach if you have uh, uh, very good students for a moment. If some of the students are not interested, if uh, inside they have no shared, in not only shared interest, but shared spiritual experience of thinking about it, you, not, you, you have no ability to teach them. It's all just wasting time, wasting time. And so you see, uh, we as researchers and we as teachers, uh, we stand between uh, two possibilities. The first possibility is to write Summa Theologia, uh, which is certainly making a filthy fish. A filthy fish, as you, everybody, know, everybody knows, is the cheapest thing to do. That's why it, it is a Jewish food. Uh, Jews, uh, they have no money to, to eat fish uh, by itself, so they, uh, they filled it with bread and something very cheap. Uh, or uh, you, uh, um, you prepare something extremely delicate, uh, uh, some deli, but then the stomachs uh, of your clients uh, are too... Um, not, not many of your clients may that just what you are preparing. And then at the end of my discussion, so thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, as far as I understand, our um, regulament is that we in general have some five or ten minutes after each lecture to a brief discussion, so perhaps somebody would like to open one. Yes. Not only the discussion, just to get more information. Could you please name some other examples of 
from the apart from Clemens? Apart from Clemens, yes. no. No, actually, the, the, uh, there was some, uh, uh, something mentioned in the treatise on Jewish, on uh, Greek literature, mm -hmm. which I do not remember, but uh, they, uh, they are not preserved. No, no, 